So, to continue my uh, series of talks on great works of phenomenology, I come now to Maurice Bello Ponti's Phenomenology of Perception, published in 1945. The principal ideas in the work are that the world is not as realism contends, the cause of our consciousness of it, but neither, as idealism contends, does our consciousness constitute the world by providing order and meaning to intrinsically meaningless sensations. The human body is no mere physical body, which can be understood in terms of purely causal relations between its parts and between itself and objects. As lived, it is rather the bearer of our most fundamental grasp of and orientation to the world, which provides the basis for our more conscious personal activities. The human mind is not sheer mind possessing a pure rational comprehension of the world or of itself. Human rationality is rooted in human perception and self-knowledge is mediated through bodily expression and action in the world and through time. Man is not determined by his past, his temperament, his situation, but neither is he radically free in relation to these motivations. His freedom is found in accepting them and taking them up in free choices in which one preferred motivation is refused only by accepting another, and which can only gradually modify the basic direction of personality. So, the Phenomenology of Perception is Moses Merleau-Ponty's second book, Following the Structure of Behaviour, which was a critique of psychological behaviourism, published in 1942. Phenomenology of Perception incorporates various insights from the earlier work, but also deals in depth with many matters which it did not treat or treated only cursorily. This work defines the main lines of the philosophical position to which Merleau-Ponty held for most of the rest of his life, with significant changes in the direction of his thinking only clearly emerging in the various fragments which were published posthumously as the visible and the invisible. Phenomenology of perception is in some respects less, but in some, in many respects more, than its title suggests. It is not a systematic orderly analysis along Husserlian lines of perception regarded in isolation from other modes of human consciousness. Rather, it is a kind of ontology of human existence in which perception is shown to play a most fundamental role. In the range of its topics, which include embodiment, sexuality, the relation between self and other, self-knowledge, temporality and freedom, the work is comparable to Jean-Paul Sartre's Being and Nothingness. Indeed, the influence of Sartre, who was Merleau-Ponty's friend and associate for many years, is often apparent, although Merleau-Ponty avoids the abstract oppositions and paradoxes of Sartre's thought and presents a subtler, more concrete conception of these matters. In the working out of his position, Merleau-Ponty also comes to terms with such giants of modern philosophy as René Descartes, Immanuel Kant, and G. W. F. Hegel, 
His work reflects as well his familiarity with 20th century French thinkers such as Henri Bergson, Léon Woodwig, and Gabriel Marcel, and with psychological literature, particularly that of the Gestalt school. But most significant influence on his thinking is clearly phenomenology as represented by Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, and Max Scheler. Merleau-Ponty's understanding of phenomenology is presented in the preface to his work. Phenomenology is, he says, or rather involves an attempt to recall the pre-scientific experience of the world on which our scientific knowledge is based, but which is often passed over by an attitude that mistakenly takes scientific knowledge to be absolute. He credits Husserl with developing the method by which the absolutist pretensions of science could be criticized, but declines to follow Husserl in the idealistic direction that characterized much of his work. Phenomenological reflection does not lead, Merleau-Ponty says, to recognition of oneself as a transcendental consciousness somehow apart from the world, but to the revelation of our being in the world, being in to be understood as meaning not simple spatial location, but inhabiting, being involved in. Moreover, our reflection on essences does not disclose them as a separate sphere of being, but rather should serve as a means for clarifying concrete existence, our living experience of the world and ourselves. The Introduction to Phenomenology of Perception is a section subtitled Traditional Prejudices and the Return to Phenomena. Here Merleau-Ponty critically examines certain concepts and assumptions which have had the effect of obscuring rather than illuminating the true nature of our perceptual experience. Chief among such concepts is that of sensation. Sensations are usually conceived of as an isolated inner state which the perceiver undergoes as a result of external stimuli. The constancy hypothesis in psychology postulates that uniform stimuli produce uniform effects of this sort. But this attempt to construct a causal account of perception is inadequate. merleau ponty argues, Nothing in our actual experience corresponds to this concept of sensation. Our perceptual life is not composed of isol isolated states. In it, every element has some meaning in relation to the whole. Perceptual consciousness is not the sheer feeling of an inner state, but is, in the phenomenological sense, intentional, is directed toward, is consciousness of something other than itself. The empiricist conceptions of association and projection of memories, or the rationalist conception of, for example, judgment as processes, which remedy the deficiencies of sensations, only reflect the inadequacy of the concept of sensation. Association and memory must somehow be suggested, motivated, by present experience, which thus cannot be a blind sensation. Judgment is based on a perceptual field having some inherent structure which it seeks to make explicit. The fundamental error of both empiricist and rationalist accounts of consciousness, Merleau-Ponty argues, lies in what he calls the prejudice in favour of the world. They presuppose a conception of a fully determinate objective world and attempt to understand 
consciousness on this basis, either as a mere effect of this world or as objective knowledge of it, rather than beginning with an unprejudiced examination of that perceptual experience through which there comes to be a world for me. Such reflection will disclose perception as neither the passive undergoing of sensations nor the active rational constitution of the objective world but as a living relation to an ambiguous pre-scientific perceptual world. Having thus set the essential task of his work, Merleau-Ponty turns to the crucial topic of the body. His discussion, which occupies the first main division of phenomenology of perception, proceeds largely through reflection of, on scientific findings about the body, findings which he contends have been seriously misinterpreted by scientists themselves. He attempts to establish that the human body is not an object in the world, a mere physical, physical body, that concept of the body is an abstraction from the concrete lived body, which is one's point of view on or one's openness to and the base of one's orientation toward the world. Because the theory of the body and the theory of perception are, of necessity, closely related, Merleau-Ponty's account of the body provides an avenue to disclosure of the concrete perceived world which underlies the objective world depicted by science. Merleau-Ponty reflects on reflections on the body are extraordinarily rich and only some of their most basic themes can be indicated here. He points to a number of considerations which preclude the body's being adequately conceived as an object, as something which is related to other objects, or whose parts are related to one another only externally and mechanically. The study of the nervous system has shown, he says, that no simple localization can be assigned to the ability to perceive a specific quality. Sensible qualities are not mere effects of stimuli, but require that the body be somehow attuned for their perception, as the hand in moving around an object anticipates the stimuli which will reveal the object to it. Merleau-Ponty provides a particularly illuminating discussion of phantom limb experiences in which a person seems to feel, for example, pain in an amputated limb. He argues that this phenomenon can be explained neither in terms of mere physical factors such as stimuli affecting the nerves which had been linked to the limb, nor purely psychological factors such as memory of the lost limb or refusal to face its loss. Rather, a phantom limb is experienced when objects are implicitly taken to be manipulable, manipulatable, as they were before loss of the limb. It is a matter of our projecting ourselves into a practical environment of our embodied being in the world of our ambiguous concrete existence at a level prior to the abstract distinction of the physical and the psychological. The body is no mere thing, it is a body subject, the seat of our habits, of our innate and acquired capacities and orientation toward the world. As such it provides the general background from which our most conscious, personal and rational acts emerge. Merleau-Ponty subsequently deals with the nature of bodily movement and its relation to perception. Consciousness does not move the body as what moves an object through space, he argues. Rather, the body moves insofar as it inhabits space, insofar as it is oriented in relation to objects. Our perceptual powers are themselves intimately interrelated. The unity of the living body is the unity of a style, comparable to the unity of a work of art. Our powers work together in disclosure of the world. 
Merleau-Ponty's account of the body concludes with discussions of sexuality and of the body as expression and speech. His discussion of sexuality, which involves some very subtle reflections on Sigmund Freud, depicts it as a general atmosphere which suffuses life in such a way that it can neither serve as a total explanation of our existence nor be isolated from other modes of our being in the world. Neither a matter of, ma of ni neither a matter of mere physiology, nor of sheer consciousness, sexuality is a mode of our being in the world, a basic manner in which one embodied being can exist in relation to another. In his discussion of speech, Merleau-Ponty criticizes equally empiricist psychologies which construe our use of words as the mere result of physiological processes and rationalist conceptions which take words to be merely external accompaniments of thought, linked to it by mere associations. Both of these views deprive the world itself of meaning, but, he argues, thought and speech, either external or internal, are essentially bound up with each other. Contrary to most of the philosophical tradition since Plato, Merleau-Ponty denies that meaningful speech must be preceded or accompanied by a separate process of thinking. Rather, we think in speech. And although thinking sometimes seems to run a steep seems to run a step ahead of speech, it nevertheless requires linguistic exp expression to establish itself. The phenomenon of speech must ultimately, he adds, be understood as of a kind with other modes of bodily gesture. Their meaning is imminent in them. The whole expressive dimension of our body embodied existence stands as one more proof that the rigid Cartesian dualism of thinking substance and extended substance is inadequate.